Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Leslie presents, and now your host, Paul Leslie. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our pleasure to welcome our special guest, David Pomeranz. Thanks so much for joining us. Oh, you're very welcome, Paul. Nice to speak with you. My first question, for okay. all those that are listening from everywhere, who Drum is roll. David Pomeranz? <laughs> ah, <laughs> well, good night, everybody. Ever since I was a little boy in this lifetime, I, I've been very inspired by beautiful music and, and uh, rhythmic music and just music in general, you know, pop music, Broadway music, any, anything great. And I would feel things and go places emotionally that nothing in the world took me to, nothing. And so I kind of patterned my artistic life anyway to be involved with this, this whole beautiful area of, of music and work really hard at it and try to be as good at it as I, as, at it as I can. So as to have people experience what I experienced when I was a kid, you know, it's the, and, and continue to, obviously. You know, it's when you get the goosebumps or you get the emotional effect or you get the inspiration or whatever that is that uplifts a person, that's what I'm into. Whether it's up-tempo music or ballads, it doesn't matter. When you were growing up, was, would you yes. say your house was a musical house? Very, yeah. My father is a, a terrific singer. My mom played the piano, my sister sang, we all would perform around, uh, or, you know, uh, sing songs around the piano in the living room and, uh, and such. And they always played music and, you know, again, you know, show tunes, classical tunes. My parents were into early rock, too, you know, so, yeah, we were always playing music, always, always. And it was a big part of what we shared together as a family. What was your favorite music growing up? There are two answers, really. My favorite piece of music probably was the score to West Side Story. That was the thing that made me go, oh, my God, somebody wrote that. <laughs> you know, happened to be Leonard Bernstein and Stephen Sondheim. But, it, I mean, but as, a, as an eight- or nine-year-old boy, that really impacted me compositionally. And then, and then listening to, you know, the songs, the older songs of, you know, Richard Rodgers and, and such, that, it, com again, compositionally, these guys just moved me very deeply. But as far as performers and, and recording artists and such, um, obviously Beatles and, you know, everything I was raised with along those lines, performing-wise, there was a guy, maybe you remember John Sebastian, who used to be with Love and Spoonful. He was the lead oh, singer. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, um, Do You Believe in Magic and all that stuff, What a Day for a Daydream. John Sebastian was someone I, growing up in New York, I used to see at the Bitter End Club in the Greenwich Village. And he was by far the most incredible performer I'd ever seen because he was so in communication with the audience. And I thought, I want to do that. So, you know, so pop-wise, he was my inspiration as a performer. And compositionally, it was Bernstein and Rogers and those guys. And then, of course, I was in bands all the time, mostly because I loved playing music and mostly because I wanted to, you know, I wanted girls to look at me, which I think most <laughs> most male musicians, you know, would, would have to cop to. And so I was in bands, you know, and I, and I played all the pop music of my, my childhood, you know, and uh, it was good fun, good fun. I'm glad you said that about John V. Sebastian. He mm -hmm. still remains an incredible performer. Have you seen him? Did you, did you ever see, catch him live? Yeah. Isn't he I amazing? I did catch him live. But yeah, he is amazing. Where, well, where did you, can you where remember did you see the, him? I'm sorry, go ahead. I saw him, no, it's all right, I don't mind. I saw him in Roswell at the Roswell Cultural Arts Center. This was wow. probably six months ago, and I interviewed him before the show. Are you kidding me? You just did, you just saw him. Oh, my Lord. I was on cloud nine. <laughs> I loved it. That's extraordinary. Yeah, he's, he's got something very, very unusual. So anyway, go ahead. What were you going to ask? I was going to ask you, can you remember the first song you ever wrote? Yeah, it was called Queen Cleopatra, and it really stunk. And, but, it, but it was, <laughs> but, you know, I, I just learned to play the guitar. I was maybe, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, what was I, 13, 12? And uh, I had some new chords, and I played it for my parents, and it went, Queen, oh, Queen Cleopatra was irresistible, 
the owl and the cat were nonsensical, but you and I could be inseparable if you were in love with me. And I thought that was pretty frigging cool. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and my parents went, very good, David. That's very good. And I'm sure my dad turned to my mom and said, where did he learn those words? You know, but there you go. That was my, that was my first song. You've done so many things in music, from singing, songwriting, performing, recording. Could you pick a favorite part within music? Oh, boy. No, you know, I can't. And, and, uh, and the reason is, is that they, they, they scratch different itches. Uh, you know, performing and singing and recording even have their own special perk for me personally, it's their own special fun, their own special uh, requirements, you know, that I, that I get into and, and try to best myself in, you know, get, and get really good at. And that's, so that's one area. And then, and then writing music and, and lyrics is a whole other muscle. And then writing music and lyrics for the theater versus pop records is, is yet a different thing. But it all sort of boils down to singing and playing. I mean, pardon me, singing and, and writing. You know, people ask me, like, how do you do all these things in all these many areas? And, it, and I, it's like, it's just, I'm just I'm singing what I write. And sometimes other people sing what I, what I write. But it's, that, that's the simplicity of it. And, and it goes together. What does it feel like when you're writing a song and you think you have a keeper? Like when you mm -hmm. look at it and you say, I think people are going to respond to this emotionally. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's very exciting because because I if I'm if I'm moved by it then then I know then it's what you just said you know I know I, I know kind of instinctively ooh this is a keeper this is this is really good and I get very very tickled by it and and it's funny you know sometimes most most of the time those kinds of songs do connect with others and every once in a while they don't and I'm always and and when that happens I'm always surprised I mean I you know like. I go, listen to this, and I'll just play it in concert or whatever, and I'll get maybe a polite applause, and I'll go, Hell, you know, are, are you guys listening? <laughs> Is anybody out there? You know, so it's, a, it's always a funny one. But generally, uh, I, think it, I think it's, uh, if I'm feeling really strong about it, then other people do too. Is, okay. is there a song of yours that you think people have connected to the most? I mean, my most popular song, I think, is, is trying to get the feeling again that, that Manilow popularized years ago. And I think m many people know me for that. But the most, I say it's the most popular or most successful song, I should say. My most popular song is something called It's in Every One of Us. And that's something I wrote on, on the Arista album that I did years ago. And it seems to be, and it's sung all over the world and has been recorded countless times by, I mean, recently Clay Aiken, uh, Kenny Loggins, John Denver, the Muppets, on and on and on. Over the years, it seems to resonate with people most perfectly and, and kind of goes on. It's the most timeless thing I think I've ever written. Well, tell us about the inspiration for that song. Oh, interesting. I was, I was working in San, I was living in San Francisco. I was living in San Francisco and I had just read some books by uh, a guy called L. Ron Hubbard, who, I don't know if you know him, but he, he, uh, he wrote a book called Dianetics, and he was the founder of Scientology. Anyway, I was very inspired by, by what he had written and uh, was driving down the 80 turnpike uh, near San Francisco and wrote the song in the car. And it was just, I was just very, very moved and touched by the simplicity of what Mr. Hubbard had said because it was true for me. You know, and that, you know, it's in every one of us to be wise. True. <laughs> you know, maybe not. And, and, and the truth of it is perhaps is what's made it uh, so liked and, and, and sought after. And, and tell us about the other song, Trying to Get the Feeling Again. That's a song that a lot of people have connected to. Oh, yeah. Well, I wrote that in San Francisco also, interestingly. And it was, a, it was a, an assignment for the Carpenters years ago. My publisher said the Carpenters were looking for a song. and. So I went home and worked for months writing that song. Honestly, it was months. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't be satisfied with what I was doing. And I wrote version after version, finally did a demo of it, sent it to the Carpenters. They liked it. I heard later, but I never heard back from them. And then the next thing I knew, 
the demo found its way to Bette Midler, and Barry Manilow at the time was Bette Midler's producer, if you may remember. You know, he produced some of her early albums. And he heard it at her house, the report goes, and said, gosh, this is a great song. If you don't cut it, can I? And she said, yeah. <laughs> so that's how it happened. But it's, you know, it's about, I was having a, a rocky time with my first wife back then. And, you know, we're, you know, feelings uh, weren't always there. That's what the song was about. Well, what did you think of Mr. Manilow's version of your song? Well, I liked it a lot, and I, I, never, I, never, I never thought of it the way he did it. He also did uh, one of my songs called The Old Songs, which we can talk about later, but, but it was a similar thing. And I, I listened to it, and I go, oh, and I was surprised, you know, and I liked it very much, but it was not what I had heard in my head. It was what he heard, and, and I was fascinated with it. And I, I do like it very much, both of those, songs, those records he did. Take us back to when you were 19 and you got your record deal with MCA. What was going through your mind when that happened? Oh, when it happened, you mean? Yeah, what had happened and what, did, what were you thinking at the time? What, what was going through your mind? Oh, I wanted to be a rock star, and I was thrilled. I mean, my God, you know, I was going to, I was going to, you know, be Paul McCartney. I was going to, that was it, you know. I was, I don't know, 18 or whatever. I mean, my parents had to, or 19 maybe, they had to sign the Guardian contract because I wasn't of age. Yeah, that was great. And, and then we, you know, we recorded it with a guy called Ray Ellis, who was the producer. And Ray Ellis was the producer of Billie Holiday. And I went, wow. <laughs> it's like, wow, are you kidding? And so I got to work with this legendary arranger producer, you know, in the jazz world. And it was a very interesting record we put together. It was, it was, it was pop music, and it had some jazz spin on it because of Ray, you know. It was, pretty, it was fun. And from there, you got to perform with a lot of people touring. Yeah. Tell us about some of the ones that stand out in your mind the most. Well, gosh. I got to, I mean, I got to tour extensively with the Carpenters in the 70s, interestingly. And um, that was my first sort of big, big step. And as you can imagine, it was a full-blown pro, you know, rock circus tour, you know, with, with airplanes, not buses, and that, that level, you know. So that was pretty great. I remember Karen Carpenter, I remember once we were in a, uh, just briefly, we were in a, a, a plane going from somewhere to somewhere. Karen wasn't, wasn't around because it was a small chartered plane. I couldn't see her. And then somebody said that Karen wanted to see me, and I, and I looked up, and she was, she was flying the plane. <laughs> I went, uh, 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 and uh, we sat down, and we were talking, and she was very competent. She had the head, head set down and the whole thing, and she was flying the plane. It's pretty amazing. So that was pretty cool. And then, and then after that, oh, my God, Air Supply uh, was an, a, a, the next uh, level of, of tour. But that was buses, and that was more rock and roll. You know, that was more the, the archetypical rock and roll tour, you know, with, with buses and, you know, guys drinking and doing who, all kinds of stuff. And that was fun. You know, it was just fun. And then, you know, I've got to play, you know, a lot, of, a lot of shows with a lot of artists. But then there came a time where I just started to do more headlining myself and, and like that. But, but those were great days. Those were really fun days. A lot with, with uh, George Benson. I, I did some very funny things back then, too, because the, the agencies that I worked with didn't always match us up. And I wasn't the only one. But they didn't always match us up with uh, the perfect lead act. So uh, there were a couple of occasions where, you know, I was, I was coupled with, like, say, a guy like Rasan Roland Kirk, who's like, I don't know if you know oh. who that was. Do you remember him? Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah I he, heard, listen to his music. Rick. He's a ge yeah, he's a genius. I mean, he's an absolute genius, but completely wrong <laughs> on the show with me because, you know, I mean, you know, his audience would come, you know, you know, is very sort of, you know, fundamental kind of R&B, black, caftans, you know, at the, at the time, you know, black power thing, you know, that, that vibe. And, um, and I showed up, I'm this, you know, this little white guy with, with an acoustic guitar, and I come out and I go, hi, everybody, and they go, 
what the, what is this guy? <laughs> you know, what is he doing? <laughs> I don't you know. And they started to heckle me, and they were booing, get up, you know, and and all that. And I remember getting so mad during one of the shows. You know, I just stopped because I, you know, I liked what I was doing. You know, and uh, and I remember, and I talked to them, and I said, hey, you know, I said, look, I said, you may not. You didn't come here to see me, obviously, but I think if you listen to what I'm about to do here, you would like it. So just please, just respect me enough to just listen. And they and I and they went silent. And and I started to play, and then I'd get sort of like you know, go oh, Dave, you know, David boy. <laughs> they were like in back of me, you know, because I because it. You know, they knew I was right, and they and they gave me the respect, and that was a real that was a real great moment for me personally because I I knew that they that they weren't that they were sitting there with a bias, and if I could cut through that that circuit, that mental circuit, you know, the bias, the prejudice, or whatever the heck that was that was, then it would be fine. And I sort of really adapt adopted that through my whole career. And I really like Sebastian, I like John Sebastian. That's what I loved about him. The communication was the deal. That you stand there and you be with those people and you give it to them, that they're not some amorphous crowd in the dark or something. You know, that they're people, individuals, and you play your music for each one of them. So those kinds of experiences really trained me and, and helped me. And, and uh, there you go. I wanted to talk about your album Born for You. Sure. This is a was a either was or is the all time best selling album in the Philippines. Yeah, yeah. I think the the category is the the big biggest selling international pop album in the history of that country. Yeah, in the Philippines, and that was that came out in 1999. So it's about 11 years ago now. Do you have a, a pretty big following in the Philippines? Yeah, it's uh, quite remarkable. For some reason or other, the, that country's really embraced my records, and, and uh, it's been a wonderful experience. I go there quite often, have many, many friends, and play, you know, coliseums and huge, huge theaters there, and it's just, it's been a real blessing for me. I just love those people and love going there. I grew up in the Philippines. And really? It seemed like, yeah, I sure did. Wow. Well, you know, while we're on the subject of the Philippines, mm -hmm. over there we watched a television show mm -hmm. growing up. I was born in 81. Mm -hmm. We watched Perfect Strangers mm -hmm. <laughs> religiously. Mm -hmm. and, I, and that's a really, it's a terrific song. Oh, well, thanks. The, the, theme, the theme song, it, you know, it yeah. works on us more than just a theme song for a television show. And yeah. a lot of people remember that show. And so I'm hoping you can tell us about that. Oh, sure. Um, that was an interesting project. I didn't write that song, uh, but I uh, it's called, uh, what was it, uh, Standing Tall on the Wings of My Dream, right? I think, that, I forgot the title exactly, but but I, I was asked to sing it. And the way that came about was um, that I had done some some songs for television shows by, produced by guys called uh, Miller and Boyette back there. And... Uh, did some of their theme songs, and then when the when Perfect Strangers came in, they asked me to sing that one as well. It was written by Jesse Frederick and Bennett Salve, and they did a lot of the um, of the Laura Mars shows back then. They did Full House, and they did you know some of these other great ones. So yeah, but that was that was wonderful, and and uh, I loved the song myself, and I do it in my conscience even now, you know, as a, as a as a as a lark, and people really like it. You've had your songs have been covered by so many people. Can mm -hmm. you pick anybody who's recorded your song that you would say, this is my favorite rendition of one of my songs? Wow, what a good question. These are good questions, by the way. Thank you. Well, you know, uh, there have been, there've been uh, parts of songs that uh, I, can answer, I can answer that more, more truthfully that way. And then, and then I'll look and see what, if there's a whole, a whole recording that, that I felt that way about. Um, usually, I'm a little, I'm a little critical of of them, and I, there are there are recordings that I've heard that are beautiful, but again, that I would maybe do, have done it differently or whatever. But there was, do you know who Cliff Richard is, or do you know that name? 
Cliff Richard. Uh, a lot of the Americans don't know him as well as the UK guys, you know, the guys in England. He's like, he is like one of the gods of the UK. He's like so, so well known. And he, he recorded several of my songs and on one of them called I Still Believe in You that I wrote with Dean Pitchford. Um, and he recorded it and, uh, there was a part in the song that they orchestrated it much more beautifully than I imagined. And I fell apart listening to it. I thought, oh my God, that is so beautiful. And I, and it, and it was one of those moments like when I was a kid again, listening to West Side Story. It was one of those moments. I mean, it was with my song, <laughs> which made it, you know, all the more sweet. So that was one. Uh, the other, uh, interesting one, which you might not think, uh, would be, but there it is anyway. I uh, had a song, uh, two songs, in uh, a West End musical called Time, uh, which was produced by Dave Clark from Dave Clark Five, those of you who may remember that, that band. And uh, he was in bits and pieces, for God's sake. Anyway, so uh, in the show, one of my songs, it happened to be It's in Every One of Us, uh, that they used for the show, was performed and recited by Sir Lawrence Olivier. And as you can imagine, you know, it's like, oh, my God. So my parents came over to see the, the opening with me, and my mom and dad are sitting on either side, and on comes Lawrence Olivier saying my song. And my respective, my, yeah, it was one of those wow moments. And my respective parents on either side each dug their, their claws into my leg, you know, each, on either side at the same time, you know. It was that was quite a sweet moment, and and you know all sorts of interesting things like that. You know, uh, uh, when we did the Little Tramp album, my Charlie Chaplin musical, and Richard Harris sang the role of of uh, Elder Chaplin. I went down to his house in Nassau, and uh, we found a studio there. Anyway, and he recorded one of the songs, and he added some little Richard Harris isms that I didn't expect. Again, I, you know, I fell apart. It's, you know, just little things that he, that these, that these artists do that uh, are just, that make them as great as they are. I've been very, very privileged to have those moments with, with these great, great artists. I wanted to ask you specifically about the song that Harry Belafonte did of yours. Mm hmm. Tell us about that. Well, you know, that was also, it's in every one of us. And, Here's what I know about it. I, I never actually heard him do it in concert, but he did. And uh, it was part of his show for some time. And the story goes that my mother was uh, in an eyeglass store, an optometrist uh, place in New York City, and Harry Belafonte walked in. And she said, oh, Mr. Belafonte, I'm the mother of David Pomeranz, who wrote It's in Every One of Us. And the story was that he came up to her face-to-face, -face, nose to nose and sang the entire song for her in the store. <laughs> you know, and that was also one of those moments where my mother said, you know, Dave, I left my body. <laughs> it took me a few hours to, you know, to get it back in again, you know. So that's, that's that story. I, don't, I never got to hear him do it, which I, I'm sorry to say. Well, just a second ago, you mentioned the, the chaplain. You had this project, Chaplain Life in Concert. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. Tell us about that. Well, the musical I wrote about Chaplin was called Little Tramp. We did it in England, and then we made a recording of it. And it's about the life of Chaplin. It's about, you know, this very interesting life. And Richard Harris was on the album, uh, with, along with Mel Brooks, who played the part of Max Sennett on the recording. We had uh, Tim Curry. We had Petula Clark play Charlie's mother. Uh, Lea Salonga, you know, from Les Mis and Miss Saigon. Uh, sang the role of Charlie's wife, you know, so all these songs of mine. And, and then since then, when I came back to the States, I decided to make it a performance piece for myself. So aside from the fact that it's a, a full-scale musical with lots of people in it, I went and did it as a one-man show. And that's what I'm doing now. I'm actually, I'm, I sit there at the piano and I perform th all 30 characters and I sing the entire two-hour show. And so that's, that's Chaplin, A Life in Concert, and we've been doing it at performing arts centers around the States, and it's going really well. I have so much fun doing that. You mentioned earlier about a project that you're going to be launching soon 
with mm-hmm. Kathy Lee Gifford. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think everybody would like to hear about that. Well, sure. Kathy and I have written two musicals, one called Under the Bridge, which ran off-Broadway in 2004 and five, uh, which is a lovely family musical. And then we wrote one called Saving Amy, along with the wonderful composer David Friedman. David and I each wrote half the score with Kathy lyrics. And what people don't know about Kathy Lee, and hopefully and certainly soon will, is what an incredibly talented writer she is. I mean, people know her as, as the charming host, and they know her as the terrific singer and like that. But they don't know her writing ability. So for both of these musicals, she wrote the book or the script and the lyric. And in the new one, actually, she wrote one of the songs, she wrote one of the melodies as well. Uh, so she's very, very talented. So the three of us wrote this thing of called Saving Amy, and it's about the evangelist, Amy Semple McPherson, who was very, very famous in the 20s in America and 30s. And that's a great story. And so we're opening that show in Seattle at the Fifth Avenue Theater at the end of September, and we'll run through the end of October. If all goes well, we'll bring it to Broadway from there. So we're very excited about it. It's something we've worked very hard on, and I hope people will love it. I wanted to ask you about this latest album of yours, A Personal Touch. Yes. It's a very romantic album. (laughs) Yes, it is. Well, well, on that note, would you say that writing romantic songs come easier for you? Oh, I don't know. Sometimes. There's no rule for that. Depends on how if I moved, and depends on what and who I'm writing about. I think even if I write on assignment, I mean, I, you know, I'm sure you feel the same way. You know, as as a somebody in the media, you know, you you have to sort of find something honest and true. Otherwise, it's gonna it's gonna be bad. You know, and people will smell it a mile away. You know, that that you've been false. So you have to sort of dig in, and even if there's nothing there, you got to find something. And so that's true for me with my spiritual songs, uh, my rock songs, with my love ballads. It's got to be something that, that moves me. And so uh, I go and find it. I go and look, look in my own universe, or if I'm co-writing, I'll do it with my friends or whatever, and, and we'll find something that, that gets us off, you know, that, that makes, us, makes us excited. So, yeah, I mean, the, yeah, there you go. Well, you take a song like the old songs. Sure. I was looking at, the latest, I think it was called Ultimate Manilow, the latest. It's so hard for me to pick because I like a lot of the songs he's recorded, but that might be the best song on the album. Oh, cool. I wanted you to tell us about that. To me, it's a great song because it not only do you get the feeling of the song, mm-hmm. but also you almost, I anyways, I almost see a story taking place. I can see the old 45s. So tell us about that song. Sure, I'd be happy to, and especially because I want you to know about who I wrote it with. It's a guy called Buddy Kay, and Buddy Kay was a songwriter. He passed away, I guess, about maybe five years ago or so. But he, through, through the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, and 80s, he had hit. He, in the 40s, he wrote Full Moon and Empty Arms. In the 50s, he wrote Speedy Gonzalez for Pat Boone, which is like something I heard when I was a little kid. And you better come home, Speedy Gonzales, do, 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 that thing. And, and so Buddy K was like, oh, my God, it's Buddy K. And then he wrote, and then he wrote, A, You're Adorable. Remember that tune? I know that song, yes. Oh, uh, yeah. A, you're adorable, B, you're so beautiful, that thing. So this is, this is like one of the real guys, you know. And so he and I sat down. We wrote, we were writing a song for Jennifer Warrens at the time, who was one of our favorite singers. And, uh. And it was the old songs. We came up with the, with the idea, and I kind of cobbled the melody together, and we wrote a, we wrote a nice lyric together, and he he's put his little special magic in there. And, and, and when we finished it, I, you know, I thought, my goodness, this is such a simple song. I thought, God, is this any good? <laughs> you know, I, I said to him, I said, God, buddy, I don't, I don't know if this is really, if anyone's going to like this, because it's just so simple. And he said, no, it's got a thing, and wait, wait, wait. And then I played it for my publisher, which is Warner Brothers at the time, and, and Ed Silvers, and, and I played it for him, and he, and he cried. And I went, ooh, I'm very glad I didn't throw the song away. <laughs> so I recorded it on my Atlantic album, 
and Barry heard it from my record. I guess we had sent it to him or something like that. And the rest, they say, is history. What is it you like about music? Music is is a very inside experience, and it's just something that gives me just deep joy. And I, I can't really say much more about it. It's probably the same thing for you and for anybody else. It's just a, it's got, it's a, it's a vibration. It, it's a frequency. For some reason, beings, people, you and me, we all like these freq- these frequencies, and it's, uh, and God knows why, but we do, and I'm so glad. <laughs> it really, I don't have much more to say. It's just there, and it's a great, great gift, and I'm very, always very appreciative to be here on Earth uh, to experience music. You know, I mean, we've got spaghetti and meatballs, and there's sex, and there's good friends, and there's perhaps a glass of wine at, you know, at, at your favorite, you know, place where you speak, where you talk about beautiful things and art, and, you know, I mean, there, there are certain experiences that I have that I count as like, yeah, this is why I'm here. This is what I love most of all. Or when I'm studying, you know, Mr. Hubbard's work or whatever, whatever sends me and does it for me. And music is that other thing. What is the best thing about being David Pomeranz? I guess the best thing is that I've had a chance to have a lot of friends. I like being their friend, and I appreciate that they're my friend. And I think that's the, kind of the best thing, honestly. Uh, aside from the alone moments or the, I should say, the inside moments of, he- of hearing and making beautiful music. The other aspect is to, is to work with great people who want to do great things. I love banding with, peop- with like-minded people who, who are into the hu- human freedoms, you know, human rights and you know, anti-drugs and, th- you know, people, but people who are actually you know, feeding people, ending hunger and this sort of thing. I like banding with these kinds of people who are really doing something and really active about it and not just talking about it and complaining. And so um, that's what gives me a lot of excitement in life. You know, I actually play with other people and enjoy it so much. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing to be here. On that note, I have two final questions. One sure. is kind of lighthearted, but I think okay. nonetheless it reveals a lot about a person. Okay. What is your all-time favorite meal? Oh, well, it's, it's pizza and spaghetti and meatballs. If I could have them in the same sitting, I'm set. I mean, I'm, I'm Mr. Simple. I don't need, you know, Coco Vin or anything like that. <laughs> That's what I like. For my last question, it's open-ended. Okay. For all the people who are listening in, no matter where they are listening in from, the Philippines or New York City or wherever, what would you like to say to all the people who have listened in? I'd like to say that truly, I know as, as, as phony showbiz, this might come off, and I, I really uh, want to say that I love you, and I, and, I, and I appreciate that you're there, and that I have a chance to play music, and that you listen to it. And I, it's, really, it's really truly a thank you, and, uh, and I feel that very strongly. And, uh, you know, I just want everybody to do well, and to know happiness, to have an exciting life, and uh, an enriching life. That's what I wish for everyone. I like that. Well, Mr. Pomeranz, I thank you so much for this interview. Oh, well, it's, it's my great pleasure. You're really good at this, by the way. I know you know this. You've been thank doing you it a while. Thank you for saying that. No, you're really good. I mean, I, I really enjoyed talking to you, and you've got, these are great questions. Well, thanks so much, and I hope to see you perform in Atlanta at some point. Good. Is that where you are, in Atlanta? I'm in Atlanta. Yep. Good. Absolutely. We will be in touch about that. All right. Well, have a good one. All right, my friend. Thank you, and take care. Bye, everybody.